Okay, we've been dealing with Cain and Abel still. Um, someone was talking to me about Galatians and how that really deals with the firstborn and was real excited about it. And they said, are you going to deal with that? And I said, I'm lucky to get out of Cain and Abel, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> but um, what we have been dealing with, uh, to be honest with you, I... I have spent my due diligence searching this, and uh, I try to, after every class, to put a red thing that says I ended last class here, and I think I did that this time. But as I was reading what is following, I was going, you know, I'm just so familiar with this material, it's like I've already shared it before. So if I have, it's still good for you. <laughs> It is, yeah. So, <clears throat> we're talking about uh, Cain, and we've been discussing, uh, of course, the relationship between Cain and Abel, which was a relationship. We, we really don't know much about their relationship apart from um, Cain killing Abel. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. And um, so... We don't know if they argued before that, but anyway, um, and <clears throat> we were discussing the fact that a lot of Cain's, uh, we, we looked in the book of Jude and there are other places to look, uh, whether it was <clears throat> um, momentary anger or whatever, but we find in the book of Jude that there was the way of Cain. And so it wasn't momentary anger. It was a way, a way that he carried himself. And <clears throat> it had to do with uh, unfairness. Uh, it had to do with um, uh, pride and uh, with, um, with assuming that he was going to be the firstborn and that all those benefits would come to him, not realizing that it was not based on birth order in reality, not with God, but it was based on a certain, uh, I'll say it like this first, a certain sacrifice, but that sacrifice was not just what Abel offered, although God was pleased with that, and he was not pleased, he, he did not favor um, Cain's sacrifice. And clearly, he didn't favor Cain. And um, Abel offered what the Lord wanted, or what satisfied the Lord, what brought pleasure to the Lord. And then he was killed by his brother so that Cain could become the firstborn again. Not born again, but the firstborn again. And so, um, so let me just read some of this to, to catch up because when I end a class, many times I'm in the middle of something. I'm re even reading uh, in the middle of something. And so it's kind of hard to pick up without at least resetting the dial here. So the wellspring, the wellspring from which came the sin of Cain was not God's unfairness in taking away his birthright, but was Cain and all the attributes and attitudes he had. <clears throat> um, there are people, we've discussed this before, that see uh, that God makes a decision or does something and they say it's unfair, but they, they're, they're worse than unfair because they have left what is important to God's heart. They have not understood it. They have... Um, um, fallen short, we've fallen short. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and the scripture says this, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, most of us get out of that as, oh, well, we've all sinned, but we also fall short of the glory of God. And, and I wish we were as cognizant of that as we are, that all have sinned, but we fall short of his glory. And in this 
in this setting and in this story, Abel did not fall short of that. He satisfied the Lord, and the Lord responded uh, with giving him the birthright. So um, attitudes and attributes that Cain allowed to rule him. Um, so in Cain's view, the interpretation of all who are of him, meaning all that are of Cain in this nature, uh, relates to what does not give to him its favor is termed as being not fair-minded and impartial. Okay, so there's that word unfair again. Justice. You know, justice. Injustice. Um, I'm constantly reminded, so forgive me if I quote it often, of the parable of the, the vineyard owner. And the man sent his servants and they killed his servants and then he sent more and they killed them and then he sent his son and he said, they will reverence my son. And when he got there, the people said, this is the firstborn, this is the one who, to whom all this belongs and if we kill him, Maybe we'll be the firstborn. I don't know where they get that from, but that's, that's what they did. <clears throat> and so Jesus, after telling that parable, says to them, what think ye that the, the father, the vineyard old owner, will do? And their response was, he will miserably destroy those wicked people. And Jesus says, have you never read the scripture? Don't you, 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 you don't seem to understand what, hap what just happened. All you see is somebody being murdered. Have you never read the scripture that the, the stone that was rejected, that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? Well, he's referring to the dead son. I mean, I hope you understand that. He's not referring to the Pharisees that said he will miserably kill them, and, and, and Jesus goes, yeah. No, he doesn't. He says, you don't understand the scripture. You don't understand what is taking place here because you see things in light of injustice and unfair and this and that, and the Father sees it in light of selflessness and of um, self-giving to the, to the degree of sacrifice. And so he says, this is, this, and then he ends with, this is marvelous in our eyes. This is marvelous. He, this is the son. This is the one that's going to be killed now. You understand that? This is the one who's going to be killed is saying this is marvelous and the parable is of exactly him. And he's saying, this is marvelous in our eyes. Because all we see is injustice. And that's, that is our minds are formed to the way of Cain. So, um, so I wrote this. Since Cain cannot bear public humiliation and shame, then in the life and dis disposition of all who are of Cain, where may we find place for the lamb and for functioning as a true firstborn son. Where within Cain has he made place for the reality that being the firstborn son means you are, God, are God's to be used sacrificially, but in contrast to Cain, Abel passed that test. Okay, so <clears throat> um, to understand the Lord is to understand that we're not fighting for our rights, we're not oppressors, we're not crucifiers. We may be oppressed, you know, cast down but not forsaken, you know, you know what the scripture says. And the, and the answer to that, and when I say the answer, I mean the true answer to that is not that you take on any number of mentalities 
that people do that is not Christ? Because the answer to that is, if it is Christ, then you're with the Father, and it doesn't matter what happens because nobody is going to ultimately separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Okay. Not only that, but there is a nature to go along with that. So when, when I say to you, well, you know, it's about, his, it's about the lamb nature and whatever, for you to become lamb-like in your mind as to what that means is ridiculous because you will attempt in your own flesh to be something you're not. Lamb-like. <laughs> and that's the first step is admitting that we are more, you know, we're more like wolves in wolves' clothing. You know? And um, if we were real with ourselves, what we would do is we would just watch our reactions and, our, and the things that, that bother us. And if the things that bother us are things that are, contrary to Christ outside of us, they should be, we should be bothered by things that are contrary to Christ inside of us. Amen? <laughs> With what measure you measure, it shall be measured unto you again. Um, so, um, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, someone can hear this and they can uh, say, well, that's dumb because people just run over you or whatever. And, and I've heard it all anyway. Um, okay, well, clearly you don't want to be run over because you're not in that place. But Jesus didn't have a problem with it. I mean, look at him. I mean... He was persecuted the whole time. People were always at him. And, uh, and if you ever read the book of Acts without rose-colored glasses, it's, there's a constant junk going on against those who, who love the Lord. Um, so so when, if, if you teach the principles of this, if I took the chalkboard and I just started drawing out the way that the nature of Jesus is, and said, this is what we're looking for, that would be wrong. Because we're looking for Jesus. We're looking for Christ in you to be the hope of glory, not a certain attribute or bunch of attributes that look lamb-like. Um, Kelly has a little puppet she uses with her kids, and it's this cute little bunny. But all of a sudden, its teeth come out, you know, and you're like, ah, you know. Um, some of us are, are pretty cute, <laughs> but you, you have sharp teeth. You have sharp teeth. So the, so the heart, the heart, the heart, always the heart has to pursue the Lord. It has to not say, okay, well, I've been a bad person, so I'm going to be a good person, or I've, I see the way I react, so I'm going to fix that. Even if you did that, even if you could do that, the father wants his son, not you fixed. Amen? That's what he's after. And he wants an increase of his son in us. And that's what Colossians is very clear on and, of course, the whole Bible. Um, so uh, Cain's view of things is premised upon who is deserving, okay? So anybody remember that in the um, book of Esther? Who is deserving? Remember the, the king came out and he's, he's, he discovered something in the books and he comes out in the book of Esther and in the courtyard is Haman and he says, um, what should I do for the man whom the king desires to, to honor? And the scripture says that Haman said within himself, he's talking about me. Who, who better to be honored than me? I, 
this is, this is about me. And I should be honored. I've been waiting. But now it's going to happen. No, now it's not because he wasn't talking about him. He was talking about Mordecai. And, of course, when he starts talking about Mordecai, what happens to Haman? He gets mortified. Well, we are supposed to mortify our Mordecai, too, but that's another story. <clears throat> um, the Spirit of God, Jesus, when he was on this earth, when he talked about the Holy Spirit, he never mentioned gifts of the Spirit. It's not that they're not there. He just never mentioned them. He never mentioned all the things that we, we give importance to with the Holy Spirit. He said, when he, the spirit of truth, comes. I love that. He didn't say the spirit will bring the spirit of truth, not just the letter of it. But he's literally the one who is the imparter of that to us by himself. But it's of another, and so that's what makes it pure. He doesn't speak of himself. He, Jesus said that when the Spirit of Holy Spirit comes, he will not speak of himself. He will take that of mine, and he'll show that unto you. He's pure. He is, can I say it like this? He's not about himself. He is about another, and in this case, he's about Jesus. Um, so... Uh, to, to become aligned with the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> there has to be a tremendous love and desire for Jesus that desires him to be, you know, what does the scripture say? That in all things he might have the preeminence. And I know that we make him prominent. We probably, somebody says, I have him prominent in my life. Scripture doesn't say have him prominent in your life. See, we pray over food and we do this and I give money there and I do this and da 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 da. He said, in all things that he would have the preeminence. He must increase, I must decrease. Um, but he increases in us. See, it's not just he's standing over there increasing and I'm decreasing. That's not the that's not it. It is he must increase in us. And with that will come a decrease of, of us, of the things, not, you know, like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But God said from the very beginning, before man sinned, when they were innocent, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it has what on it? Good and evil. Don't eat of the good either. And don't think you're righteous if you eat of the good and not of the evil because I told you not to eat of that tree. I talked about a tree of life that you never ate of. You never went, ran to it. Never sought it out. And you thought that, you know, see how righteous I am because I take care in looking for the good fruit to pick off of the tree that God said do not do it. Don't do it. Because the roots of that, what's it say? Um, uh, what is it? A man's way is right in his own eyes, but it is the ways of death. It's not right. It's the ways of death. It brings death. And the day that you eat, you shall surely be right. No. You shall surely be good because you stuffed your belly on the good fruit off of the tree I said not to eat of. You shall surely be good. No. You eat any of it. And so what do we do? We've already eaten, or at least through Adam and through that nature, and so we view everything in light of what's good and what's evil. Well, this is good, so this is okay. God says, Stop eating of it and stop lusting after it. Well, this is bad. So that person is bad. So, okay. So Jesus is hanging on a cross with, intentionally they put two thieves on either side of him so that he would look worse hanging up there. Intentionally. So that 
well, he's just a criminal like these guys, you know. And they walked by and they said, look at this guy, you know. If he was the son of God, he would come, if, you know, and they said that to him. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. But it's because he was the son of God that he stayed on the cross. It's the, because he was the son that he stayed on there, not used his power to get out of it. But he died for you and he died for me and he gave himself. And then he not only did that so that we would be saved, but so that the, that life would be imparted to us so that by his nature we could give that others may increase and be blessed. So um, we, we can listen to some of these things uh, that we talk about, and we can look at them, and we can say, well, that doesn't seem right because da-da-da-da-da. Then we would probably do the same thing standing there at the foot of the cross. Well, that, that, you know, not that this doesn't seem right, but we go, well, he probably deserved it. We don't know. The leaders know. <laughs> right? I, I don't know. He probably deserved it. He probably was a deceiver. No, that is the Son of God. And, and it looks evil, but it is neither good or evil. It is God. It is life giving itself, that kind of self-giving life. So um, we, we, if we always use the example of the cross, we go, oh, I wouldn't have been fooled, you know what I mean? I, uh, I would have known exactly what's going on. Nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew. So only Mary of Bethany seemed to have a clue because when she's talking about his burial, that requires death. And in two days, so she's honoring his death and she's anointing his body based on death. And then there's this other guy, this thief, the one hanging on the cross beside him. One's cursing him, and this guy starts telling the other guy to shut up. You know, you can be a thief and still tell someone to shut up when they start talking bad about Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Don't. You know, you don't even know what you're saying. You deserve this. That's what he said. You or we deserve this. But he didn't. So he sees that as an innocent, almost like an innocent lamb. Without spot. He's acknowledging the sacrifice. He's moved by something. I mean... I mean, we, we many times forget. We see them hanging on the cross, and, you know, he's going, well, you know, you need to leave him alone, and da-da-da-da, and Jesus is going, forgive them. And we don't realize that they are in excruciating pain and hurt and tired and bloody and hungry and thirsty and everything else hanging there. They're not going, oh, you know, it's, it's a pretty nice day here or whatever. They're, they are, but... But this thief who is in that same situation is saying this guy didn't deserve this. He's without spot. And then he said, you know, he called him Lord. He called him Lord. And Jesus said, this day you should be with, my, with me in my kingdom. Okay. Well, who knew you were going to have a kingdom today? <laughs> you know, I was just commenting on your nature. Who knew that I would get to be with you, with you? I'm going to get to be with you. We say, I'm going to get to be with you in the kingdom. 
But how about I get to be with you beyond this thing that we're going through, beyond that. Whatever's going on now, we can be with Jesus beyond this. Did you know that? We don't have to wait for him to come down. We can be with him. <clears throat> so, um, and when it comes to why Abel died, Cain also has his own version. Of course, I mentioned this before. Abel, Abel was, uh, he didn't deserve this. You know, he didn't deserve this. Okay, so I deserve this. Cain says, Abel, excuse me, you don't deserve this, so I'm going to do something to you that will change the game. Whether, whether we talk bad about somebody or we set something in motion or whatever we do, we're Cain because... We've got a problem with someone we think is undeserving or, you know, flaunting their, their uh, situation and making you jealous or whatever. And so Cain says, you, you didn't deserve this, so that's why I killed you. And it's okay. You know, it's okay. Abel's undeserved exaltation is, is what caused him to be killed. It was not right for him to be given such a place. Along with being deserving of honor or other attributes that are built into the makeup of Cain, his rights and the maintaining of them were his definition and conceptualization of true justice. True justice. True justice is when my rights are protected. Well, that's not true. That's absolutely not true, especially if the Son of God is, is in you. Jesus gave up his rights so that we would have rights, but then he wanted us to be able to give up ours so that others, so that this spirit, by this perceived, will, will all men know that you are my disciples because you have love one for another. Well, that's not what I call sloppy agape. You know, huggy, kissy, you know, you know, I love you, I love you too, you know. Um, we can, anybody can do that. Hippies did that real well. <laughs> you know. And they even look more like Jesus than we do. <laughs> At least the Jesus pictures that we see. It's not, it's not that kind of love. By this perceive ye the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's what it says. Okay? Again, and I quote this often, we know John 3.16, for God so loved. But do we know 1 John 3.16, by this perceive we the love of God. For God so loved, by this perceive we the love of God. God so loved, God in the tal manera, right, Patty? <laughs> in this manner, love, that he laid down his life. By this can we perceive the love of God. This is by what, by which all of us will be known as his disciples. That he laid down his life for us and we See, that's this, I mean, if, if Jesus was standing up here and he was taller and then he laid down his life for us, he passed it down and then we're next, but we're a little shorter and, and we ought to do that too. And then you keep it passing down. There is a spirit, there is a, a flow of that which is eternal, eternal. Or there's a continuation of Cain, you know. Some of you probably, your parents, when you acted up, 
and I said, what is, what is Randy doing out in that yard? He's out there raising cane. Anybody ever hear that before? He's out there raising cane. This is the cane, you know. I wasn't out there growing sugar cane, that's for sure. <laughs> Are we resurrecting Cain? Are we the reincarnation <laughs> of Cain? A long, let's see. Um, but God's measure is never based upon rights, but based upon who is willing to give up those rights in order that those less deserving may gain. In other words, God has one measure, his firstborn son. It is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, I mean, there is a faith, and that faith is supposed to be unified. That faith is that we are coming into the stature and image of God's firstborn son. Okay, that's, that's the faith. Till we, it is uh, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, so there is not just a growth in Christianity and not just a growth in what's right or wrong. There needs to be a growth in him, his life, his nature, his spirit, his way, his seeing, his thoughts. Um, it's till we all come. We're, we're, he's waiting on us. What is God waiting on? Till we all come to this to the knowledge of the, unto a perfect man. So he's not trying to make you perfect. It's the stature, the measure of the stature of Christ that's perfect. But we come into that by oneness. And we can, you know, uh, I was thinking about it today and I, th I was talking a little bit about this with someone, but the, when, um, when Israel came out of Egypt, you know, the firstborn, they were the ones supposed to, to be after the image of that and to go unto God and sacrifice. The rest of Israel came out, but you know what? Everybody ate the lamb. The lamb didn't die for everybody, but everybody ate the lamb. Did you know that? The lamb died for the firstborn, but everybody put the lamb inside of that. So they're walking around with lamb in them. But they're, not, they're completely ignorant of what God has put in them, completely unaware. They could have just looked at it as a meal or like those Lord's Supper. This is just a, you know, a meal, not even a meal, you know. Um, but that Lord's Supper is a picture of the lamb, the broken body, the poured out life that we put on the inside of us. Well, they're walking around. And the murmur and they're doing at the Red Sea and all of that, they are completely devoid of allowing that to get in, to having been inside, to start filling them, to start strengthening them, to start being the mind that they have. And so what happens when they get in the wilderness? What's the wilderness like? What are they like in the wilderness? Well, yeah, they're like us. Is that what you said? <laughs> they're like us. Unless Christ be formed in us, which Paul said, I travail in birth. I travail in birth till Christ be formed in you again. And he's talking to church people. Okay, so... Um, in that sense, we have, like Israel coming out of the wilderness, we have a choice. Our choice can be to serve God in religion or to serve him by his son. 
his firstborn son, like Israel. So they come out and they're just murmuring and complaining and everything. So they get to Mount Sinai, which is not that far in the journey, especially since it's going to be 40 years, you know, 39 plus, you know, 10 months or something before it's done. God just says, okay, you know, this is, you're not, you're not living by what I put in you. And he put Jesus in all of this. You're not living by what I put in you. So I'm just going to put you under the law, see how you do. And he says, by the, the scripture says in the New Testament, by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the purpose of the law, you know, we run from it, but, you know, it will show us what's, what's not Christ. It'll show us what's missing. Okay, so then from then on, until Jesus shows up for, what, 2,000 years or whatever, 4,000, 6,000, they, they serve God in a religion. When God never had a religion in mind, he had his son in mind to put in there. That's what he had in mind. That's always what he had in mind. I want to put my son in there, but it's my firstborn son, and, it, it, and his way is as a lamb. And... Um, Well, I was thinking about it today that when the Lord began to reveal the land to me in Jeremiah, I really couldn't hardly tell you hardly anything about what the book of Jeremiah is about except that I saw the lamb in Jeremiah and I saw him pointing, pointing to... Babylon and saying, stop fighting, come under this, this is the Lord, and they're going, no, we're going to stand up for God, and we're going to save our, God will save us because we have the temple and the religion, and we have all the right things, and we've been serving God all these years, and the, you know, Jeremiah is saying, basically, you're devoid of the lamb on the inside of you. You, you you've left, or you never really came fully into it. And, and uh, so you need, he's going to work this out. You need to go into captivity and there you're going to find God because as long as you have religion, you're always going to think you're going to have the temple and you're going to have the sacrifices, but you'll never be a sacrifice and you're going to have all the prayers and you're going to have all of this stuff. And as long as you have all of this, you're going to think that you're just fine. But God's going to remove all of that He's going to take it all away and he's going to put you in a foreign land with foreign languages and foreign customs and, and everything that's contrary and there will be no more sacrifices and there will be no more of this. And so then you have Daniel and the three Hebrew children and as it goes through Ezekiel and popping up these who who was it that called it a little sanctuary? Ezekiel. A little sanctuary here in captivity, you know. And then since there's no altar here, the altar is going to have to be in our lives. This is where we will live. And Okay. But, but almost nobody, I mean, I really feel like basically nobody really got it. And God understood that, and they all resisted. No, these are the holy scriptures. And God's going, it's that, you know, you may be reading the living Bible, but it ain't the living word. He's the living word. And you may be going through the motions, but you're devoid of what I put in you from the very beginning. There is no sign at all. I mean, look at the... Look at what he put in them and then look at the next 40 years. It is an abomination. Okay. So God, God is not trying to protect our religion. You know, somebody said, well, you know, the, the Muslims, if they keep multiplying, they're going to take over the world. I 
I got nothing to say. <laughs> but is God capable of doing the same thing today and just saying, you know, I'm going to take away your steeples? Oh, no, not our steeples. Not our stained glass. No. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come take it all away. Come take it away. You, you, okay, so it's horrible. It's horrible for all those people living in captivity. Uh, some are living there. Few are living there in captivity to the Lord. But the vast majority in captivity, this is wrong. Oh, you know, we hung our harps on the willows. We we're not going to sing the songs of Zion here. Why not? Sing them in your heart. You know, but it's always resisting every, ah, this is, ah, I hate this. Why? Why? God's going, why not? You know, nothing else was working. And he tried for years and years and years and years and hundreds of years and hundreds of years. And so he said, well, you're gonna, those who will learn will learn a lot more here in captivity of me. They will find me. They will quit going, well, this is, this is holy. This is holy water. It's precious. And the Lord's going, it's just water for God's sake. Just leave it alone. You know, <laughs> all these things that we just, you know, um, you know, you, I, I could just go on. He wants his son. He put his son in us. He's expecting that, sin to, that son to increase and for us to decrease. And that's, that's the basic story. You can find it in, in Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians and First and Second Corinthians and Philemon and all of the Bible because God wants his son, but he but he had his son before the foundation of the world. So what's he want now? He wants his son in us. He wants that life. He, he wants his son to be able to inhabit us. You know, I've heard so many people talking about, well, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. He wants to inhabit you. Good, let him inhabit your praises, but he wants to inhabit you. Don't forget that, <laughs> right? Don't forget that, that he wants to inhabit you and I. And so he sends the spirit of God back. There's all this religion. There's all, there's this, there's the, the holy temple. There's all the sacrifices. There's all of this. And Jesus says, look, I'm going to die. I'm going to be a sacrifice and I'm going to be able to be put in you, and you're going to signify that by the Lord's Supper, but what you're going to live to do is put my son in you. So I'm going to die, but I'm going to send back the Holy Spirit because he's going to declare realities that are beyond all of this that is around you that you think is it. He's going to come, and he's going to, he's going to speak purely. It's going to be pure. It's going to be unadulterated. It's not going to be uh, mixed in with all the earth and all of that. He's going to be able to show you me as I always have been and not as a Nazarene. So that's that. That's a good plan. I mean, he didn't. I mean, he didn't say, "I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and He'll tell you how to build church buildings. He'll tell you how to evolve from hymns to contemporary worship. <laughs> That's not his goal, you know. I prefer." contemporary worship, but I prefer him. 
And, uh, you know, I, it was probably about a year ago, man, I started going through something in my, my left hand, which is my guitar hand, and it really felt like I, could, I wasn't going to be able to play anymore, ever. And I just said, thank you, Father, for all the years that you gave me. How wonderful has this been? That up to this point, it was so wonderful. I, I never said, heal it, fix it, please, I gotta play. You know, it was about him. It's not about playing. It's not about doing the thing. And I, I'm fine now. <laughs> and, and I just love the Lord. He didn't have to do that. You understand? He didn't. And I didn't even expect him to do it. I just wanted him to know I was very appreciative that he would have given me that gift and opportunity to do that for all, basically my whole life. <clears throat> it's not about the music. It's not about the hands. It's not about what I can do. It's not about this and that. I'll go ahead and tell you just a little story, and I don't know where this will go, but I don't know. I don't know how long ago, but my hands started shaking. And look, look, they're shaking. And I know, um, you know, I know Albert in Holland. He started, uh, what's it called? Parkinson's. And he started getting, and it does more to make your hands shake. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes with it and everything. And I've just watched it continue, and I go, hmm, well, but do you remember the story that I said about him and I sat down with him and he said, Randy, pray for me because I'm having a hard time remembering the scriptures and remembering the things that I knew of the Lord and please pray for me. He spent his whole life serving the Lord and this was scaring the fool out of me. And I went away from there praying, uh, Lord, do this work in me, this work where I, I know you and I'm aware of you, whether I can remember the scriptures or not, it's not about the book, it's about you, that I would have you, that you would have me, and that uh, if it, that ever came, that I would be able to be with you, whether I could speak or do anything or was so crippled and paralyzed well that's kind of what I got already <laughs> I mean other than because I mean if I'm not depending on on playing the guitar and this or that then I'm on the right track and I'm not talking about me we we have to get to a place where the temple and where the book and all of that, I'm not saying don't read your Bible, but I'm saying it's about him. The book is about him. I'm here for you, Lord. I'm not here to learn stuff to impress people or depress people, which is probably what I'm doing to you tonight. But, but we just, we're just constantly trying to do something, find something that'll do this. Instead of just getting quiet and just just wanting to be with you, Jesus. I just want to be with you. And and just speak in your heart. Go to your heart for Jesus. Go to your heart. Don't go to your brain. But we do that. We go to our brain. I don't know what to pray. What's the use of sitting here stupid? I don't know what to say and I don't know what to pray. Well, neither do I. But I... You know, I'm satisfied to just be and be with him and believe that he's more content with me quiet than he is with me loud. Amen. And I remember, I remember we used to have solemn assemblies where we'd all just gather in a place and then we'd just move the chairs out of the way and we'd just get pillows and stuff and we'd just sit around usually for a couple hours and sometimes we would do that for a week or so and and I remember one time I was in solemn assembly and and uh, and I was just sitting there I mean a lot of people were reading some were praying slightly 
whatever, and I'm just sitting there like this. And they came over and said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, I mean, you're just sitting here. What are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm waiting on the Lord. And he said, but I mean, you don't. What are you do? I mean, what are you doing? I said, I'm, this is what I'm doing. I'm waiting on the Lord. You go, well, he's not talking to me. I'm waiting on the Lord. <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm still waiting. It doesn't matter if he talks right now. My heart wants to be waiting on him. Or I can just get up and be busy and then say, well, I'm tired of waiting on you. It was at least 10 minutes. That was too long. Just, wait. just be waiting on him. Just be waiting. The Spirit of God will bring him like the morning dew. Praise God. He'll bring the refreshing of the Lord, the refreshing that is the Lord. So that's our hope. That's where we're, that's, that's it, you know? I mean, there is... Um, we can describe Cain, and I think that's good in this sense. I think it's good because I think that we got Cain in us. And I think that we need to see that and then hate it and then say, I want Jesus. Um, but we cannot describe Jesus. No man can describe Jesus to the place where you can get him the way you need to get him. A preacher can plant seeds, and the Spirit of God can, you know, give the increase. Or, or he can water, but the Spirit of God gives the increase. God gives the increase. Because no man can see him clear enough in such a manner to just go, here it is. Well, you say, well, then what's, what's the hope? Well, divine connection. The vine, I'm a branch, and I am connected to him. And that hadn't changed since I got born again. I'm just using me as an example, so let me just turn it for you. You are a branch. You are connected to him. That hasn't changed since you got born again. You are still connected to him. But we haven't abode in that, so we say, Lord, start Breaking, you know, we may, we may not be a big old branch. We may be a little tiny twig. You know what I'm saying? A little tiny, you ever seen a little tiny twig? We may be that and go, well, look at that big old branch over there, and I got nothing. Just keep, keep letting the life flow into you, you know? He's the one who brings forth the fruit. He's the one who brings forth the being larger. And why would God make you a larger branch so that there'd be more room for his son? We go, no, because I'm special. I'm a special branch. I am. I can tell by the way I look compared to all of y'all. You know, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. No. No. Our hope is in that oneness. And from that, when we, when we stop trying to do it and we stop trying to bring it out in that sense but bring it through, then the Spirit of God can fall on that because it's, it's the way it is. It's Jesus said, abide in me and I abide in you and you'll bring forth much fruit. It's that simple. So leave your religion, Amen. Well, I'm looking forward to us getting together around Thanksgiving to just uh, not come to a conference, but to come to Jesus, you know. 
it won't be just teaching. It won't be just worship. It will be times where we can just seek the Lord, where we can just um, be there with the Lord, where we can um, where we can pursue Him beyond what we are, where we are at this minute, where He can pursue us beyond what he would do if we're out there running around doing our job or, you know, all the things that we do. It, you know, it's kind of hard to chase us because we, we move pretty fast. <laughs> so he's going to, so he can pursue us. Father, I just pray that, um, that your spirit would be released in a greater way upon us, not not just at the time of gathering, but I just cover this body in the sense of Lord that 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 the evil one I just rebuke you, Satan, with all your lies against people when they feel less or when they feel like they don't fit in or they feel like they don't know everything. I rebuke you, Satan, and I command you to leave them alone. And Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that your dove, your gentle dove, would come and begin to identify Jesus, land on Jesus in us, and bring him forth. Bring him up out of the waters unto life to be lived among men through us. So well, Father, we thank you, we, we thank you, we just thank you that it is not all complicated, it is your desire, your great desire, your great longing that we may have what you love, Jesus, that we may have what you love, your firstborn son, and we may have it more abundantly, more abundantly. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name.